Hey friends, we're back with another episode of the Power Nine Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Eggert. Today's guest absolutely loves to help people find their natural gifts and guide them to achieve more than they ever thought possible. I've gotten to know him over the last couple of years and he lives this mission every single day. I'm excited to share with you the journey of my friend, Jack Bandy. Jack, yeah. I'm so happy to finally have you on this show. It's <laughs> like so many people have asked me that know you in C9, why hasn't Jack been on the show? And and finally, you succumbed to the pressure. I did, yeah. So Kalik pushed some pressure on me. I reached out to Sarah, to Rob, and Jasmine. They all said, you yeah. got to do it. You got to do it. Yeah. So here I you am. You got to do it. Yeah, and I promise I'll, uh, I'll be nice, uh, especially on the nine oh, questions please. part. So, um, but I think, you know, you've just had a fascinating journey and you've dedicated your life to, to serving other people through coaching. And I like to dive into kind of what led to some of that stuff. So you're a big fan of the podcast. You've said it multiple times. You listen to a lot of the episodes. So, you know, the deal, let's start early. Um, where, where were you, where were you born? I think where you were born and raised are different. So where were you born and raised? Yeah, I was born in Michigan, but raised most of my life in Minnesota. So yeah, so I don't remember anything about Michigan. My dad moved around a little bit before um, settling into Minneapolis area. Um, so I grew up in St. Louis Park. Um, and yeah. That's kind of what I remember in my journey. Did you stay in St. Louis Park all the way through uh, going up to college? Um, yep, yep. And then went to the U of M and then moved down to campus. And that was just an important kind of life transition to break away from and figure things out on my own. Yeah, cut the. But then after the... after college, we ended up buying a house. My wife and I buy a house in St. Louis Park as well. So yeah. that was nice. yeah, kind of stayed in that community. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree there. Yeah, yeah. The uh, so uh, you mentioned that your dad kind of did some bouncing around a little bit. What what was what was your dad's uh, dad and mom like? What was their career choices? Yeah, my dad was in sales, um, and back in the day when sales was you know you. If, if there's any sort of problems with any customer, you buy them a bottle of scotch or you, you, you schmooze them at the Vikings games and those kinds of things. Um, but he was he was um, into his career, um, loved it, uh, really invested a lot in it. But he was he was on the road a lot um, in yeah. sales. And so didn't see him a whole lot, but he did make an effort to really make it to my events, my swim meets. Um, I think he made it to just about all of them and was very involved in that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. How about your mom? Yeah, she was, she raised, you know, my, two brothers. So the three boys, which <laughs> I admire her for being able to do that. Yeah, right. um, but she, she stayed home with us and always, you know, took us to the morning practice and was there for us and made sure we had food on the table and all that kind of stuff. She was, she was a cook. She loved it when friends came over and consumed lots of food. Um, she yeah. was just always wanting to make and build that community. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're the youngest of three you, you alluded right. to. Um, do you feel like, and you, I think you know where I'm going with this, you know, you, you, you know, people at, at the, through your coaching practice on, you know, where people fall in, in the family and how that aligns with, you know, their mindset and, and things like that. Sometimes you, you talk to people that are youngest and they got away with highway robbery when the oldest was, you know, under the gun all the time. Where do you fall in that dynamic with your brothers? Yeah, I looked up to my brothers um, and still stay in touch with them a fair amount. They're they're both have moved away, but um, st you know do kind of miss that connection. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think um, I did get away with a little bit more than they may have. Um, but it it the, my mom and dad were pretty. I don't, don't want to say strict, but you know they had their expectations of us, and you know it, it was expected we were going to go to college, and you know find careers there wasn't really much variation from that so that was yeah. um always kind of the standard for us um and we and i followed in those footsteps yeah uh were you a were you a good kid or were you a troublemaker i can't imagine you being a troublemaker <laughs> i'm just gonna i'm just gonna throw that out there yeah no i was pretty much a good kid i was a rule follower and yeah. uh yeah just didn't uh push the edge and, and still notice that today. It's sometimes I have a hard time pushing that edge. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. The, you, so you talked about swimming and I know that that's always been something that, that, um, I go back to a little bit with, with you being, a, a, I think you actually even do some swimming now still. And so yeah. what, uh, so that, that was your, I think that was your thing, right? It was swimming. Yep. And it was just, I, I was not a very good swimmer, but it was the, you know, just the friends and, you know, my close friends were doing it. So I was mm-hmm. hanging out with them and that's, that was just my tribe and that was my community. Um, loved it, found a lot of value from it and then went on and became a, a high school swim coach um, and just loved being around the sport. Um, turned into running because you couldn't find a pool uh, everywhere you went. So, but now my knees are shot from running so much so i'm now back in the pool again but yeah that coaching was just kind of a indicator of what i loved to do um and in fact i um, just recently did a a leadership session with a group and the ceo invited me in to lead this session and i actually coached him when he was a freshman in high school wow and he shared with that his leadership team that I was the one that taught him how to set goals and to stick to the goals. And he still remembers that today. And it's like, Oh my goodness. It's like, yeah, you no never way. know the impact you might have on somebody. So that was, that was really impactful for him to share that and remember. Yeah. That. And I think that there's such a, we've talked about this on this with, with the multiple guests that have athletic backgrounds or have done coaching is that there's just so much that correlates between sports and and per, you know, I'm going to say just personal success. I'm not even going to get the business BS into that. I'm just going to say more of just like, just that, that early mindset of, of goal establishment and having the right kind of coaches like yourself to help guide uh, young people is so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, to have that discipline, to have, to see people, you know, to, I mean, I remember my coaches just, Hey, you kind of like distance. Let's give that a try and to notice um, that in people. And, you know, just, it's just so impactful. And, and as I was coaching people, you know, somebody would come up, do you think I could do that? It's like, well, absolutely. You know, just being and giving those people that confidence. And that, that carries into being a coach as well as sometimes people don't see the gifts in themselves and just through the power of asking questions um, can help them uncover some things about themselves that they may not not have known and that was with me with sports I, I could be able I could do go out and do something I I could run a marathon if I put my mind to it and put the time in and put the effort into it was there a coach whether it be swimming or otherwise that had a particularly uh significant impact on you to where you even to this day kind of look back and be like I, I you know I I I'm I that helped shape me to where I how you do your coaching in business now yeah, that's a good question. You know, a lot of, I, I like to say, uh, you know, today I have my, I call it my personal board of directors, those people that I go to with, you know, questions or perspectives or whatever. So, and the great thing about that is, you know, I can hire and fire the people on my board of directors without them ever even knowing it, but All right. I can it to one, you know, it's easy to go back to my high school swim coach because actually the assistant coach was the one that, really kind of brought some light to me and what I can do. Um, but other than that, just a, so many people that had an impact on my direction and, and what I found to be important for me and to get yeah. the most out of what I was doing. Yeah. What, uh, so where did you decide to go to college? U of M. Yeah. I'm a golden gopher. Are you a big golfer fan? I, f- I feel like you're you're uh, you're into that kind of side of sports. I am. Uh, I am a so sometime to an extreme a sports nut. You know, it's yeah. like I'm always checking scores and box scores and and that kind of stuff. And so yeah, I follow Minnesota sports too much almost. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a go to, are you a go to, we're, I'm going to, sorry, I digress a little bit here, but uh, That's right. are you, do you like going to the events in person or do you just like watching them on TV? You know, it, um, I, that's a great question. I just recently got seasoned or, you know, a, a pack to go to the basketball games with my daughter and, and her husband. And that was fun, but it was just kind of like, it starts to get to be too, oh, complicated, you know, parking yeah. and getting there and all that kind of stuff. And, um, so yeah, 
I, I, I like it. I just don't know if it's worth the effort and energy to to go down to campus and, and that kind of stuff. So I, I sure do like being able to just put it on in the background and watch it on TV. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm, you know, I like going occasionally. I don't like to, you know, I, I, I'm always find it fascinating people that have season tickets and they just made, you know, I like, like, let's, let's say the Vikings, right? Like on a, on a noon game, uh, for, for the Vikings, you got to get down there at about 10 just to get in the stadium. Yeah. You're not getting home yeah. until five 30. You've basically dedicated a whole Sunday to it. I don't know. It's just, it's not my thing. I got, I got the farm to take care of. So I don't, I'd rather <laughs> just, I'm like you, I'd rather have it on in the background. Yeah. 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 Cause then if it goes south, you can just do something else, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. What, uh, what'd you go to college for? Yeah. That's so funny that you asked that. Cause I, uh, at first thought I wanted to be a math teacher, then was kind of discouraged with that. And then, um, wanted to, I think I was a little ahead of my time, wanted to get into their corporate fitness programs or run a health club, you know, be a health club manager. So I studied, um, FIAD and business administration, and then got discouraged when I got done with school and couldn't find a job because it just they weren't there. They were hiring physical therapists or um, sports medicine, those type, types of people. Um, so then I thought, well, I need to get something that I can get a job. So I went back to math education, be a math teacher, mm-hmm. and then got a job at Cargill working part time that it was like, uh, get married, let's move on, see where this Cargill thing. So I didn't finish the the math teacher route because being you had to have a teaching certificate to coach mm-hmm. high school swimming. So they um, that was one of the drivers. Yeah. So yeah. ended up working for Cargill and thirty well, years you you spent there. Thirty years, yes. Yeah, oh my gosh, I like like I I knew that you were there for a long time, but but that's a significant number and. Um, let, let me go back real quick. So did you get married? I thought you got married kind of young. Did you get married young? Yeah. Well, let's see right out of college, pretty much right out of college. So that's yeah. young and in, in today's oh, yeah. age, but I don't know if that's young in those days. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, how long did you know your wife before you, you got married? Yeah. We met at the U, um, yeah. in a, in a, intro to small business operations class, which was full of all the gopher hockey players. So <laughs> you, you take it from there and make the right. assumptions that you want. <laughs> right. Well, she definitely picked the winner out of that one. I can tell you that much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. There yeah. you go. Yeah, for sure. All right. So let's take a, I want to take a quick little break here. We're going to listen to a few of our community supporters. Uh, and then I want to get into your time at Cargill uh, because, you know, I, I run into people that worked at Cargill and they've, their, their paths have crossed with you multiple times. I always find that interesting. And so I want to talk about uh, your career trajectory, how you got into doing what you're doing now, sure. but, uh, but let's get, let's listen to a few of our community supporters and then come right back. For Seek Search and Consulting is thrilled to support Coalition 9 and this podcast, and we are just as excited to have them as a partner. Verseek is a Minnesota-based, high-performance recruiting firm that specializes in interim solutions, direct hire, and executive leadership search. Their team of experienced professionals and seasoned leaders across various areas of expertise and industries have been in your shoes. They quickly assess your whole company and identify key elements that will take your business to the next level. Your company's success hinges on the capacity of your people, and few areas of your business are more critical than your finance and accounting team. Your company success hinges on the capacity of your people. Verseek can help connect you with the talented candidates within finance and accounting, along with other areas of expertise in executive search, direct hire, and interim solutions. People are the ultimate business advantage. Find your people together with Verseek and make the best possible for your business. Learn more and contact Verseek by visiting verseek.com and following them on LinkedIn. Regardless if you're a startup just figuring things out or a medium-sized organization with a full team, having a legal partner by your side is crucial. Siler Law is fiercely loyal to their clients and are passionate about removing headaches and roadblocks that can pop up during the growth of your business. Whether you need general outside counsel, are planning a business transaction, or even need someone to guide you through the estate planning process, the team at Siler Law are the advocates for you. Visit SilerLaw.com to learn more. Siler Law, where experience meets pragmatism. If you're an entrepreneur or married to one, your journey is complex. You want financial advice that impacts your whole net worth, including your business, not just stock market investments. You also want a partner that quarterbacks the relationships between the CPA, estate planner, banker, and other trusted advisors. That's where the team at eWealth Partners comes in. 
We love helping you and your spouse design a financial plan that aligns and empowers you. A plan that addresses your concerns, priorities, and goals tailored to reach your long-term vision. A long-term vision that is worth the pursuit today. Visit eWealthPartners.com to learn how they can help couples like you. eWealth Partners, holistic financial planning for entrepreneurs. Investment advisor services offered through AdvisorNet Wealth Management. eWealth Partners and AdvisorNet Wealth Management are not affiliated. If you're anything like me, you know enough to be dangerous when it comes to finance, yet need some help when things get complicated. All-in-One Accounting provides the right financial expertise and leadership to align with your stage of growth. From outsourced accounting and bookkeeping to strategic financial planning, the team of accounting rock stars at All-in-One Accounting are passionate about positively impacting the businesses and lives of their clients. You need to check them out at allinoneaccounting.com. All-in-One Accounting, taking our clients from financial chaos to business clarity and beyond. The topic of talent is hot in organizations of any size, and I would argue none more than small to mid-sized businesses. That's why it's crucial to have a partner to help you navigate all the HR idiosyncrasies so you can focus on working on your business and not in it. Insperity is a full-service HR partner with a high-touch, high-tech platform helping owners work through challenges like employee retention, company culture, and benefits, just to name a few. Do yourself a favor and explore all they have to offer at Insperity.com. Insperity, HR that makes a difference. All right, we're back with Jack Bandy and uh, and a thirty year career at uh, at Cargill, which is fantastic. And I was at a uh, I was at, at I work at this little oh well the Maple where I record some of these episodes. Um, and so in Excelsior, and there's a couple guys there that are that they do some trading, and I'll just leave it at that because that's their little business, and they they just transitioned out of a long career at Cargill. And one of the guys is, I'm going to just, I'm, I'll just use his first name, Mark. He went through one of your programs and I mentioned. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah. So isn't that fantastic? Like Small you just world. randomly meet people and, and, you know, I've never met anybody that has said like, oh yeah, it was good. Uh, and everyone's like, oh yeah, that was super good. Or that was oh, super thanks. impactful or Jack's a great guy. And he was so invested into me. So Goosebumps. That, right. Thank you. You should have goosebumps. And, you know, <laughs> and we have mutual friends that, that uh, are part of Coalition 9 and stuff that, uh, that have actually, you know, have sung your praises as well. So I want to get into some of that of, go, you know, you're going, you were going to college, you wanted to be a math teacher only to become a swimming coach, but then all of a sudden, you know, you, you're just doing this, this part-time gig, which turns into a full-time gig. Let's go through, and we don't have to go nuts here, but like, I right. think a 30 year career at one place is that it just doesn't happen anymore. And um, it's just a different time one, but then two, I think there's a dedication that's, that's put into that. And there it's a, it's a, that needs to be a partnership and the partnership yes. that you and Cargill yes. had um, to allow you to continue to grow is really fascinating. So let's dig in. Um, what was your first role at Cargill? Yeah. So it's so funny because I, I love your comment about partnership because Cargill back then was willing to take risks on people. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't have a chemistry degree or a biology degree or anything like that, but it's part-time job. I was working in an analytical lab um, and just, you know, somebody said I was a sponge. I just soaked up everything and tried to learn everything um, I could as I went. So worked in an in a analytical lab, knew that wasn't what I wanted to do, got out of there, um, became, uh, worked for our salt division and became a quality assurance manager for one of our production facilities in Kansas. So picked up her family and moved to Kansas, um, Hutchinson, Kansas. There was some culture shock there. Yeah. Um, and How long then you spend there? Uh, six years. Six years. Wow. Yeah. That's made some great, time. made great friends, um, learned a lot, uh, but knew I didn't want to work in a production facility all my career. Yeah. Um, so got into business development, business process improvement, moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Hated it. Hated it. <laughs> Um, there's, a, for there's, a whole, there's a whole movie on Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I think, you know, if you, if you look at, you watch that movie and it's just satire, obviously, but boy, they sure make fun of that town. And, and, you know, boy, you're spending a couple of, of interesting places in the, in the Midwest there. Right. Um, so go, I want to stop you real quick. So going back to Hutchinson, Kansas, you yeah. made the comment about culture shock, 
Give me yeah. an example. Give me an example of what was culture shock moving from St. Louis Park ish, right, to yeah. Minnesota to Hutchinson, Kansas. I'll just say Target. You know, <laughs> in the Twin City, yeah, right where I live now, Eden Prairie, I right. could get to three Targets within 15 minutes. Hutchinson did not have a Target, um, and so yeah, so my wife accessibility. Was not real. Yeah. Yeah. So it was yeah, just not the same access to things and, um, and yeah. yeah, just, do you get sick of the same restaurant over and over again? So yeah, just yeah. small town Midwest. And, and then you do downsize, I think a little bit, even when going to Cedar Rapids, right? Because isn't Cedar Rapids, but it's probably about the same size no, as totally. in Kansas. Is yeah. it a little bigger? A little bit bigger. Uh, had a little bit more to offer, but it's yeah. Hard, no. wasn't wasn't my kind of town so then moved to uh nebraska um Jeez. lived in omaha but worked in blair so it was about a 45 minute commute each day but mm -hmm. um lived there and then um kids were about to enter into junior high and they said okay we're going to stay through high school or we need to get back home to family and things going on with aging parents and this that and the other thing it was said well it's time to get back and so we took a risk we took a risk and Cargill took a risk on us as we as there was a HR project a transition project and so it was a two -year, committed to a two-year project but I had no idea what was going to happen after that but I thought it was worth the risk and trusted in Cargill and ended up working in learning and development which was my real passion I started seeing that passion when I was in Nebraska and some of the things I was doing there. Um, and then we created uh, some leadership development programs. And that's where it just really kickstarted what I really, really love to do. Um, and where I've had, I felt like I've had some impact on some people's lives, like you said, started this thing with. Do you, do you feel like there was a, um, you know, there's two, two, I always say this on this podcast, you know, that there, I always, I love talking about nature versus nurture. Yeah. Um, and you know, the way you were born versus the way you were raised. And, and I think I, we, we just picked up on, a, on what I would consider like a paradigm shifting event when you were spent some time in, in Nebraska, where you, the flip kind of switched on what you wanted to do for the rest of your career. So the nature versus nurture thing to me is fascinating because we could spend a whole podcast on on that and probably just with your your background in learning and development and human behavior and all that other stuff you probably uh, spent some time on that anyway with the people you work with and the people you've wor worked with so d where do you think the balance for you lies in nature versus nurture based on the the way that you're wired on on giving and and coaching yeah, I think both. And I'd be interesting to see what your perspective is. What do you notice from, you know, knowing me for a, a year plus and, and those kinds of things? Because I'm not a huge risk taker, um, but I did take some big risks in moving. Um, yeah. And I just really, I would always think that I'm going to do the best I can in the current job that I'm in and keep my eyes open to what's possible in the future and to explore what's what what's next for me and so i just really i wasn't you know chasing the squirrels but i was exploring what was important what drove my passion what was aligned to my values um that helped me kind of make some of those decisions and also just having my best coach, my wife, who helped, you know, ask some really good questions and be so supportive in all of those transitions. But I think, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I don't know how I would have answered this prior to even where we're at in this point of recording this podcast. And I'm going back to the last couple of years that I've known you. Um, you know, I think there is a, a heavy amount of nurture in this because uh, the, the way you were raised, because I think you probably saw the way your dad was moving around and, and, you know, his, the moving uh, from Michigan to here and those kind of things that were that, you know, you turned out pretty good. And so I think I can make a risk and go down to Hutchinson, Kansas or Cedar Rapids or, or Nebraska and, and make a, a, a good part of, of my career. And I also think that the other nurture part of this 
is the relationship you have with your wife. Uh, you know, I know you have a super good relationship with your wife. You, you've mm-hmm. referenced her as your best friend multiple times in conversation and, and in communication with me and stuff. So I think that that is nurture, right? Is just knowing that you've got a partner in crime that's going to mm-hmm. always have your back and that you'll always figure it out. I have that with my wife and, and, you know, we've got that, it's, which sounds like a very common relationship to where, uh, it even though you're not a risk taker and in by nature, the nurturing part of that has allowed you to take some calculated risks that have right. paid off. Yeah. Well, and it's so true what you said about we're just going to figure it out and mm-hmm. we'll just, you know, what, you know, what's in front of us and what, how can we make the best of it? And yeah. if it's not working, what's the next decision we need to make going yeah. forward? Yeah. So, so tell me a little, and then, so I talked about the paradigm shifting event. I think it was actually, you know, I would, I just picked up on that where your, your switch kind of went, went off when you were spending some time in Nebraska, which and then led to the opportunity to, for you to come back to the twin cities and yep. be part of this HR project. So tell me about this, this secret top secret HR project that you were, <laughs> that you were, uh, you were taking part in. Yeah, so Cargill was going through, you know, I love to talk about pendulum switches, shifting, and Cargill was going through centralizing HR and just needed to figure out, you know, they had, you know, probably 15 contracts with Stephen Covey throughout the organization, and they had, we were, they were developing the same leadership content in what they call these learning labs throughout the organization, and it's like, we need to centralize that because, it just was inefficient. And so I was on that project. And so out of that, there, we created a call center, we created an L&D organization, and then we centralized leadership development because we wanted to make sure there was common language through the organization. So mm-hmm. if you know somebody's talking about trust, we're talking about it in the same kind of language and expectations of what it means to build trust as opposed to in Iowa, we talk about it this way. And in Ohio, we talk about it this way. And, and so we, we were able to pull those things together um, for, you know, for economic reasons and then kind of build, helping to build and drive the culture around the importance of development of our leaders. Did you feel like, uh, so how long did you spend in that? So it was a two-year project, but it sounds to me like it probably went a little bit longer and, and you were able to extend it. It Was yeah. was that it? You know, actually, it was a two-year project that ended in a year. And then out of that came the organization. So I spent 10 years in corporate L&D yeah. and then seven years creating, delivering, um, building leadership development programs. Um from brand new leaders of people to experienced leaders with, you know, five years that we wanted to sharpen the saw, as well as high potential people that um, could be the future leaders of Cargill in the next five to 10 years or whatever. Mm. And then out of that became, we built coaching to help support the leaders. Mm. We like to say, help accelerate the application of what they were learning by working with a coach to you know, be specific around what is their growth. Was there a, uh, in the, in that time period, was there like an aha moment where you felt like some switch flip for you, even, even, you know, as you've progressed into this, you've now immersed yourself into it. You, this, this program is continuing to evolve and it's taking on iterations and you're a big part of the development of that where was the aha moment in that to where it was like, okay, I, this is where I'm, I'm dedicating the rest of my life to this. And this is where it fully, al- where I'm fully aligned. Yeah. So we, like I said, we wanted to provide coaches to the leaders as they were going through the program. And so we used external coaches that are certified. And then we said, we should be able to build this capability internal in the organization. And so we brought in the Coaches Training Institute, CTI, uh, to train us um, to become coaches. And as I was going through that training, I said, that is what I wanted to do. I wanted to to make a difference that way, people one on one, as opposed to, yeah, this leadership thing is great, but we can really have an impact on an, an individual is through coaching. 
So immersed myself in that. We delivered that some of the coaching concepts at, through our programs, as well as uh, built uh, and developed coaches. So eventually became a certified coach, uh, which is uh, through the International Coaching Federation, which is important, I think, to give you know some credibility and reliability to the practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, I went through additional coaching training through learning journeys, which is another really good program. Good. Um, so how long before, what was the inflection point of when you decided to leave Cargill and go out on your own? Well, it, it was, uh, that's a great question. Cargill kind of decided for me. So I talk about pendulum shifts is so they were, we were building all these great programs building coaching, building that culture. And then somebody said, no, we're going to change our direction and eventually eliminated all that. So they said, you can apply for your job. It's going to be a little bit different. And I said, what if I don't apply? And they said, well, we'll give you a one-year severance package. Where do I sign? It was a pretty, pretty yeah. easy decision at the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was it was good timing for me. But then I took a year off, played around a little bit, was an usher for the Minnesota Twins. I worked at the State Fair, worked at Total Wine. Um, and then I got a call from a former Cargill person said, hey, I'm trying to develop, develop some leadership development uh, with a small ag company. Uh, and would you be interested in talking to me about it? Conversation here, conversation there, and then left one day and called my wife. And I said, I, I just took a job as a director of learning development at Schooler. Uh, so worked there for three years. And then I went out on my own. So, ah, gotcha. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's that was about two years ago. And here I am. Yeah. So, it, you know, you, you've you talked about just a passion for, just in our conversations, a passion for the impact that coaching can have on, on an individual. And you've seen it firsthand over so many years of doing this. And now, you know, you've, you've, you've really shifted to where you're focused on, on helping leaders of all levels. But I think you, you, you uh, are doing a little bit more executive coaching now, obviously you're a facilitator for C9 and, and you're working mm -hmm. with some, some expanding leaders that are, that are kind of in the, in the, in the heat of their career and helping yes. them get to the point to where they're at. And so where do you, well, let's go this direction. What is a really do you have a really good success story of something that you've uh, of someone that you've coached and some of the work that you've done together has had a, a really profound impact on them as an individual? Yeah, I think, you know, it's so interesting because I, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the, I think it's like a seven minute Ted talk Dudley, um, Drew Dudley around lollipop leadership or leading with the mm -hmm. lollipop you never know the impact you might have on somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I don't, sometimes I never see that, but I think one of my favorite stories is working with a leader that really was struggling with the role they were in and giving them permission to explore something else. And then they went off and did um, uh, a three year kind of volunteer service project and then came back and just, they just were struggling with what am I leaving behind? What am I going to gain? What's next for me? What if, what if, what if? And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, what if, what if? Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the kind of best decisions they made and just seeing them thrive again today after they've come and come back from the Peace Corps. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be so gratifying to, I mean, and, and I think it's not even just big wins, which I think that, that would be kind of a big win, but I think that some of the, sometimes it's the small wins, it's the incremental wins in coaching that make the difference and th that yeah. relate to the, the big, the big win. Right. And so I think that's from your work, from the seat that you sit in, I think it's gotta be really fun to be able to play a role in, in the, in the growth of, of individuals, but then mm -hmm. just to see them continue to evolve. Yeah. Well, and you know, you've coached others. It's just sometimes asking that question that somebody won't ask themselves and they just kind of, you know, yeah. it's just like, oh, I've never thought of that. And what if, or yeah. why not? Or get out of your own way and go for it. Um, yeah, I think it can help people. 
I think that there's that aspect. So, you know, obviously I am a believer that people should be a part of a peer group, right? Because then you're creating, yeah. you know, you've alluded to like your personal board of advisors. Well, that, you know, that is another personal board of advisors that is helping people guide. I always think that it's good to be a part of a group that is, uh, that is industry specific. So you're talking about best practices, yeah. you're talking yeah. about things that yeah. continue to grow. And then I think it's really important to get a coach. And that coach, and, and sometimes, you know, if the budget doesn't allow, it's an informal coach, it's a mentor or something mentor, like yeah. that, but right, of someone that you can have a little bit uh, different kind of conversations that are more immersive into the individual, and it's not group sharing or anything like that. It's sometimes, you know, I would imagine that, uh, and I think I even just hear through this, well, hell, I experience it as just imposter syndrome, right? And I think- Oh my gosh, yeah. Right? And so- is that a prevalent tone? What are a couple of the t prevalent tones that come up? And I'm kind of a, a getting that imposter syndrome is maybe one of them, but what are some of the prevalent tones that come up in, in the coaching that you do with leaders uh, and things that you need to, to help them work through? Yeah. It, and it's so easy. It, it, people get stuck and we all get stuck and I get stuck and I have a coach and I just, in fact, just before this sent a, a note saying, Hey, do you got to, got to, 30 minutes, an hour, just to feel stuck. Can you help me get out of that muck? Um, mm -hmm. Just by, you know, asking questions and, and exploring those kinds of things. So it's, yeah, it's either getting stuck, um, letting down the armor, you know, you talk about Bernie Brown, people armoring up and it's like, how can we let that go to open to possibilities and to see what could be there and explore that as opposed to feeling like I need to do what others people, other people think I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, one of my friends, Laura Boyd said, um, we sometimes compare ourselves into despair. And it's like, what story are you making up? What data mm -hmm. do you have to point to that is true or not true? And how, how can we redefine that data so that you can create a different story for yourself? I think I think the mind the mind plays so many interesting tricks on you and you know I I I I'll just say flat out last night I I couldn't sleep and my mind was just racing and it was all rooted in yeah. in yeah. you know there's some fear based things and some you know and one? and there is no logic in the <laughs> insanity in the insanity so you know and I'm a meditator too and I tell you like I yeah I even tried to meditate through it and it just couldn't get through it and and boy you just have those moments and sometimes it's good to have another person you know whether like I said it be a, a coach or a or an informal mentor or something like that just to help you right. get out of your own head I mean the power Power of of just having so, just sh shifting the the weight the mental energy from one person you to another person and then them be able to just sort through all that crap and just be able to serve it back to you in a more logical yes. manner can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, and I just recently there's a was an article about um, what are what do people need from coaches these days and I think it's just so true that a coach needs to see there's a, another human being right there mm -hmm. that I'm going to meet you where you need to be, as opposed to, you know, I've got all these models and approaches and perspectives, but I just need to see you and be with you to let you be who you are and give you permission to be who you are and get you out of that spiral or that, that death cycle of yeah. fear-based decision. You know, it's like, you're absolutely right. As we get the human mind gets so caught up in this stuff that we just need somebody to call it out. Yep. Every, everybody needs a coach or a therapist. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> or, yeah, the best both. thing is both. Both. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's, uh, all right, before we get into nine questions here, I want to be uh, respectful of our time here. Uh, boy, see, I told you this goes so I fast, know. I don't know. so fast. Uh, let's talk about your family. Um, so you've, uh, you've been married to your wife for how long? Oh, over 35 years. I love it. That's so great. And, yeah. and how about kids? Yeah, two kids, two grown daughters, and they both have, um, they're both married and one, most special thing in the world, a three and a half year old granddaughter. Oh my God, that's a life changer too. And oh. being a grandparent is the best thing in the world. Right. Yeah. I was, I think I've talked to you a couple of times on the phone and, and she was in the yes. background. Yeah. 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 I, I had to lock the door just to make sure she didn't come busting in to say hi. Yeah. I love it. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> 
I want more people to get to know you. So uh, when, before we wrap this thing up, I'm going to make sure that you can share how people can contact you and stuff like that. But we're going to take a quick break. We're going to listen to a few of our community supporters here uh, one last time. And then we're going to come back with nine questions with Jack Bandy and, and wrap this thing up. All right. Everybody needs a bank, not just any bank, a good community bank. From personal needs like checking and savings accounts to business services like financing and M&A support, the team at Flagship Bank is there to provide you with the assistance you need so you can spend less time thinking about your finances and more time enjoying what your money can do for you. To learn more, head over to Flagship Banks, that's Flagship Banks with an S, dot com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Flagship Bank, investing in you. For more than 20 years, Kaisa has been the trusted financial advisor for women, business owners, executives, and high net worth families, developing financial plans designed to meet them where they are and propel them to where they want to be. Their mission is to remove the worry and stress associated with financial planning and replace it with clarity and confidence. The Kaisa team takes the time to understand each client's unique situation, from financial concerns to the visions that they have for current and future generations in order to create a truly customized plan. Through consistent communication and personal attentiveness, Kaisa is fiercely devoted to personal well-being and financial prosperity. Get to know the Kaisa team and how they can serve you at kaisawealth.com. Every year brings new challenges for Minnesota business leaders and USI Insurance is here to take the pressure off of the employee benefits decision. Having a local presence with national resources, USI combines a client-centric culture with leading-edge technical resources so you can make an informed decision on your benefits investment. The USI team has been deeply committed to investing into our local communities and utilizes their expertise to provide solutions you can count on to protect your greatest asset your employees. USI has been partnering with Twin Cities businesses for decades and they would welcome the opportunity to do the same for you. Visit USI.com to learn how USI's approach to risk management and employee benefits delivers customized, actionable solutions with bottom line impact. When you think of a typical CPA firm, you probably think of tax planning. Well, that just scratches the surface of what Boulay offers their clients. By providing smart, in-depth thinking from experts in accounting, audit, tax, and business consulting, they know what it takes to achieve financial success. Whether it's protecting your business, building your wealth, or securing your future, you can count on Boulay to go beyond addressing just financial matters and providing you with tailor-made, workable solutions. Learn about all they have to offer at BoulayGroup.com. Boulay, helping you get there. United Healthcare is dedicated to helping people live healthier lives and making the health system work better for everyone by simplifying the healthcare experience, meeting consumer health and wellness needs, and sustaining trusted relationships with care providers. UHC is continually focused on building a modern, high-performing health system via improved access, affordability, outcomes, and experiences. With a network of over 1.6 million physicians and healthcare professionals in over 6,000 hospitals, United Healthcare is dedicated to connecting employers and their employees to better health by offering quality benefits designed for affordability. For more information, visit United Healthcare at www.uhc.com. United Healthcare, helping people live healthier lives. In addition to the community supporters you heard from on the show today, I also want to give a quick shout out to our evolving level community supporters, Carlson Partners, Fluid Interiors, Keystone Group International, Modern Foundation, and Rev Advisory Group. All right, we're back with Jack. Uh, probably the most uh, exciting part of this podcast for you, or maybe not, uh, because- Or maybe uh, not. Or maybe not. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can tell by the look on your face. Uh, I just so, hope you don't, haven't dipped into and found new questions to ask. I got, a, I got a couple of ones I haven't used in a while. Let's just say that. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so can you confirm to me that you have no idea what I'm about to ask you? I have no idea what you're about to ask me. Good. All right. Question one. Uh, what was your first car? Oh, Volkswagen Bug. And it was, I learned how to drive on a stick. I took my test on a stick. And the great thing about that car is if we went to, if it rained too much and I went through a rain puddle on the road, I had to pick my feet up so my feet didn't get wet. <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> what color was it? Blue. Blue? Yeah, what color? Blue. Like what tone of blue? Baby blue? Royal blue? No, it's more of just kind of royal blue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm just trying to picture it in my head. Trying to picture yeah. you driving around in a Volkswagen bug. Yeah. I, I would love to get another one, a convertible one someday. Yeah, there you go. Bring back your yeah. childhood. That's right. Uh what is one quality in a person that impresses you? I'd say empathy to being able to to see beyond just what 
the words or the actions and to really kind of notice um, and and notice from a place of kindness, I think. So empathy or kind is kindness is torn between those two. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, but you know, I think um, I was just watching a TED talk on on vulnerability. And I think our society just shuns vulnerability. And I think oh, once yeah. people have vulnerability and, and that is going to drive that empathy. And I think we're getting more into, you know, I think it's probably a product of COVID is that empathy is, is so valued um, in not only leaders, but just in relationships um, yeah. that I, I, I love that answer. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's some of the most successful leaders are the ones that can show up with empathy as opposed to being too business driven, mm -hmm. you know, it's got to be, have the balance of re results and relationships, but um, it's yep. still in still, I think the results portion drives too many leaders. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, where or what is your go-to for creative inspiration? I love to be on the water. Um, and I don't, don't own a boat, but I just bought paddle boards last summer and just love it. And so I could be walk out my door and be on a lake in 17 minutes, inflate the paddle board and um, just be out there and just not have to, you know, put a boat in the water and all that, but just tool around. And so my daughters and I just love it. We all have them and we will find a lake and meet there and just, maybe have a beer or two out there and, and, uh, yeah. just take it all in. So, yeah. and that's where I go with, if I just need to unwind or explore what's possible and you just never know what that quiet and solitude and away from everything can bring. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about this, this question, because I think based on your answer in number two of empathy and me just knowing you, you're one of the most kind, uh, thoughtful oh. people that I, that I know. Uh, so this will be interesting on which direction you go on this. Uh, would you rather always say everything on your mind or never speak again? Always. So I have to speak when it's on my mind. Always say everything on your mind. So like oh. the, the, the crazy stuff that's going on in your head with that, that, that the, the few filter that I sometimes don't, <laughs> I sometimes don't have, uh, yeah. and that just, you know, it just kind of blurts out. Uh, I think you have a really good filter. So just to take, think about yeah. it. Like that filter just goes away. Yeah. I would say the other one, because I think I could show kindness and message and intention without having to use words. Yeah. Okay, good. Love it. Thoughtful answer. Shocker. Uh, <laughs> what is uh, what is one thing you have deep gratitude for right now? I, my wife. Hmm. Just, just so, I mean, so supportive of the things I'm doing and the crazy things I explore and possibilities and how she keeps this family um, together and moving forward. So yeah. definitely my wife. Awesome. What book are you reading or listening to right now? Oh, I'm in between books, but I do have um, the next one on my shelf is Life in Five Senses by Gret uh, Gretchen Rubin. Mm. Uh, so I don't know. Um, we'll see All what right. that one brings. Yeah. What, what book did you just wrap up? I uh, just wrapped up uh um it was just kind of a murder mystery or a yeah. detective you know so i yeah. the the escape Some kind fiction. of fiction yeah yeah good good get a, get a little that see i like that you give a little bit of blend and that's a little bit of your personality you know you're not all business booky or or leadership coaching stuff like that it's good to get a little mixture in there i'm with you on that absolutely one. absolutely yeah uh what is one of your hidden talents uh, I think a hidden talent, and I, I, I keep going back to coaching, is being able to see something in people that they don't see in themselves. And to, I like to say having intuition and being able to have, take the risk and call forth that to intuition. But it, it, it may or may not be right, my interpretation of that, but I just like to be curious around what might help people move from where they are to where they 
need or want to be. Yeah. So cool. I don't know how hidden that is, but uh, I have a feeling that you've oh. that to multiple people, but whatever, we'll take it. That's all right. That's true. Uh, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you rather give up deodorant or toothpaste? Deodorant. Yeah. I'm with you. I, 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 like, just... having, I like, I like brushing my teeth. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I like that one. That's a new one. So uh, those people that are on future episodes, listen up. I'm going to be using that one again. Uh, all right. Number nine. This was, See, this wasn't so bad, Jack. Come know. on. Yeah. Right? I, Peaches and cream. All right. Yeah. It's funny if this last could, one, though. Yeah. This one. That you, you've probably heard this one before. Uh, if you could have dinner with two people, one Gosh. alive and one dead, who would they be? Yeah. That's so such an interesting question. So um, alive, I'd say Adam Grant. Um, he just has got such. I just like his thought process and his curiosity and his, his, his kindness and, and his podcasts are always just so just reflective and those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I um dead. Jesus, because it's just so, just would be just so fascinating to understand that. But uh, I think the other one would be um, Abraham Lincoln because of all of his, I've, wanted, I've read a number of his books around his leadership approach mm. um, and, you know, what he was going through and during those times. And it'd just be fascinating to understand what his perspective was. So well, even if, even if you could choose three people, if you were going to have Jesus, Abraham Lincoln and Adam Grant. I think that'd be pretty fascinating. That'd Wouldn't be pretty be fascinating. Fascinating. Oh my god. Wouldn't yeah, that be I'd fascinating? Be, it's yeah. cool just to think about that stuff. That's why I love that question. I know it. I know it. Yeah. All right. You survived. I did. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, all right. Uh, I want me people to you. You shared so much about your philosophy and your style and your personality, and so naturally people are going to want to get to know you a little bit. Uh, and if they do, how can they get a hold of you? Well, I'm link on LinkedIn and I, you know, you can message me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is, and I kind of regret this, but it's uh, because when I was m creating my website and my email, I over, it's way too long, but it's Jack T Bandy at Bandy L D R D E D, which is leadership development. I couldn't do a leader development. Yeah, right. Right. It was way too long. So Bandy L D R D E V dot com. All right. And I'm going to, just for people that are listening, uh, whatever your platform is, or if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to put these, these links in the show notes. Um, we'll have a link to his, his LinkedIn profile. We'll have a link to his email address. And then we'll also put a link in there for your website. So people can go right to that. Um, and so make sure people can, uh, can get a hold of you whatever way they want to Jack, I gotta tell you, man, like our community is better, uh, because of you in it and the group that you lead, everyone raves about it. And, and one thing that I've learned in doing this for, the, the years that that we've been building this community is that the group goes as the facilitator goes. So the more committed the facilitator oh, is to the group and their personal development and showing up uh, and preparing and following up and stuff like that, it just that's what the group experiences and that feels they feel that bond and that is just a direct result of your leadership. So your your living what you teach, oh, you. which is uh, which is about as good as it gets. Oh, thank you. Well, and congrats to you because how you put these groups together, I just can't even imagine, but you do it so well. And everybody I've talked to that just the groups just kind of create themselves. And, yeah. you know, we started out, we lost two people right away and then it was a little while and we've worked as, as they say in the voice, my team is full. And yeah, so right. I'm yeah. just grateful for that. And, and they're yeah. a great group of people that lean into each other and support each other. So yeah, you're, you're doing what... some amazing things. That's what our community is all about. And I can't do it alone. It takes a village. So I got to have, have guys like you uh, uh, to help support and drive this mission home. So thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, on behalf of Jack, this has been the Power of Nine podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Eggert. And I want to thank you for the privilege of your time.